Hi everyone, welcome. We were just uh, welcome also on behalf of this panel in front of me. I'm just checking out uh, the number of attendees, which uh, which is rapidly uh, adding up. So let me kick off this uh, shipbuilding industry meetup. Thanks to all for joining from so many different parts of the world. We have customers, partners, experts from many time zones and many different uh, backgrounds, and we're all happy to have you here. Um, on this meetup that will be focused on the shipbuilding <clears throat> and the maritime uh, domain. So just before this call, we had a very exciting uh, discussion with uh, John Martin and he took us back. And uh, this is three minutes ago, he took us back also. Uh, so 20, 30 years in, uh, in his uh, life at uh, BAE and the submarines and how they applied XR uh, across the board. And, uh, and we have many uh, speakers today, uh, very, Proud and uh, it's a pleasure being here with all of them, with this powerhouse in front of us, who will be sharing their experiences, war stories, and uh, stories from from the trenches uh, on how XR is accelerating this industry. I will uh, introduce all of them uh, when the time is there. But for now, uh, a special thanks to to Jeremy, Denise. We have uh, John, John Martin, Paul McCall, JB Farge. From Sub C7, John Maxfield, and uh, Dennis, thanks, uh, thanks for joining. So uh, exciting day today. It's a packed agenda, uh, but but just a few words on uh, what we intend to do. So what is the objective uh, for today? I mean, today's objective is to look at industry trends, industry challenges. We want to address, try to address that with how XR can play a role addressing these trends and how XR can yeah, help organizations become more competitive, faster and better and actually play into these trends. That's the format and you will look at the agenda that we'll be talking about XR in general, major trends, but also specific characteristics of this, uh, this industry. What's in it for you? Um, we want this to be very engaging, very interactive. All our channels are open. We have our speakers here. We have a panel discussion at the end. Uh, we will run short sessions of 25 minutes, but please start adding your questions and, and engage with us because that's um, uh, our most important uh, role is learning, sharing, and uh, taking ourselves into the next level of this uh, XR journey. So we have, um, yeah, in, in, in the meantime, more than 100 folk counting registered. So don't let that uh, prohibit you from preventing questions. So get in, interactive and uh, engage with us. So a little bit about um, Vitalis, because we know that some of you um, don't know who we are. So we are a pioneer. A uh, global leader in advanced visualization. I mean, we're actually around for a long time, so almost 30 years, and with 20 years of experience in this industry. Uh, headquartered in the UK, we have experts and offices uh, on all continents. And uh, I think we are most known that we are service, let's say, large, the biggest companies with complex models. Most of them uh, are in the industrial enterprise. And most of them yeah, run very complex systems that we help them to manage and visualize. So the last two years, we have reinvested in a dream. And our dream is to democratize these visualizations and bring them in the hands of every relevant person in the organization, you know, without any hassle, instantly, and, um, and, uh, and also safe and, and secure. So, to do that, we invented a product called Vitalis Reach. We have one brief demo, but we will be discussing that as well during uh, during the day. So it will not be a commercial session, but we will be talking about what are the current capabilities of XR, what is the advantage of uh, collaborative XR, and how this can look like for this particular industry with a lot of examples and, uh, and case studies. So on the agenda, we'll start with Jeremy. Jeremy will share uh, the learnings from his book, current research, what's happening in the world of XR, uh, what kind of industries and use cases do we see being adopted, and what will be the outlook for the next uh, couple of years as well. Next, we will have Denise uh, talking about specific and characteristics of the shipbuilding, shipyards, this industry, 
and uh, I have some very interesting revelations and, uh, and ideas to share. We will close this session with uh, strategic capabilities uh, for the industrial enterprise. We'll look at uh, some history and we also look, uh, look ahead uh, and focus in on how collaborative XR is actually changing the game for organizations and their uh, supply chains. The second part, stay with us and stick with us, is that we need you to challenge our panel. Uh, panelists, additional panelists will also be introduced. We're going to create a, a collective view on where we are in this, uh, in this industry, how the adoption will look like, and also very keen to understand all of your point of views, uh, opinions, and uh, what we can learn and how we can actually take the next steps uh, moving this forward. So, um, you also see the book over here. Uh, we're very pleased to have Jeremy over here. So we're going to hand out five copies, five books. I haven't asked Jeremy if, it, if they're signed or not, but maybe we can ask him as well. But we will be sharing five books uh, to, to the audience and some of the winners and John will uh, tell more about it when we move along. Okay, um, first session. So. Jeremy, uh, let me introduce you briefly. So, so Jeremy is the author of uh, a book called Reality Check, and it's about how immersive technologies can transform uh, your business. And it's a highly recommended book for basically anyone to understand how VR and AR um, is being used and can be used by businesses all around the world. Jeremy is also the lead PwC XR team yeah, leader, member, and helping clients uh, across all industries uh, successfully implement it. So, pleasure being here with Jeremy. He's been Financial Time, Economist, BBC, and now at Vitalis uh, Industry Meetup as well. So, uh, Jeremy, I'll um, hand over to you. Um, we'll make you presenter. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Hopefully, pleasure. everyone can see the screen here. Is that coming through okay? Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. So it is an absolute pleasure to, to be with you all here today. And um, I'm delighted to take you through some of the, uh, the research that we've been uh, working on over the last um, few years, as well as some of the, the macro views looking into the future, as well as the present day analyses of, of where XR is in industry. But before we kick off in a big way, let's go back to basics just so everyone's on the same page. When we talk about the term XR, some people call it, say it stands for extended reality. Some people say the X can stand for anything. It doesn't really matter. It's an umbrella term for two main technologies. On one hand, we've got virtual reality, and this is where you're immersed in a completely different world. And on the other hand, we have augmented reality. This is where you're still in the, the real world around you, the physical world, but you're getting an overlay of, of information, data, virtual objects on top of that world. Best way to think about this is that virtual reality is all about immersion, whereas augmented reality is all about information. Now, regardless of whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality, the largest technology companies in the world have invested time and money in XR. And you've got companies like Microsoft, HTC, Lenovo that are pushing headsets on the market. You've got organizations like Amazon that are held, that are developing software that allows us to build experiences that will go onto hardware and headsets. You've got people like Qualcomm building the chips that will support the processing power for this, this hardware. And you've even got people like Apple who are famed not for being first movers in a new market, but actually for being second movers and introducing it, introducing a product into a market when they feel the time is right for users. And the amazing thing is they have made significant investment into this technology over the last few years. And uh, the world is waiting with bated breath as to uh, what their likely virtual reality or mixed reality headset will be. So why are all these organizations investing in virtual reality? There has to be some value there and some significant value to have so many organizations bought into the technology. 
And to answer this question, we worked with our economics team in London, in PwC London, and we we tried to answer the question at, in a macro way. And we said, what do we think the global economic impact of XR will be across countries, across use cases, across sectors? And we pulled together a lot of experts from the XR world, but also a lot of um, uh, economists and, and brought a model together which allowed us to analyze that. And the conclusion that we came to is that we expect XR technology to boost global GDP by 2030 by up to one and a half trillion dollars. And you can see here the, um, the, the sort of impact that it's having across different nations. We selected a few for analysis, otherwise the, the, uh, this study would have, would have taken ages to, to push out into the market. But if you want to check that out um, in more detail, I won't go through every country now. Uh, you can check it out at pwc.com slash seeing is believing. You don't have to put in any information. You don't have to sign up for anything. It's just free to download and access. So where does this impact come from? If I take a step back as to how we built or got to this one and a half trillion dollar number, because it is a pretty hefty number, we had to start with the, the value. Where does XR add value in the world of business? And across all of the use cases that we analyzed of all the different industries using the technology, including ourselves, we could bunch everything into one of these five buckets here. And here they are in decreasing order of impact to get to that one and a half trillion dollar number. But starting with product and service development, this is all about how do you get a product uh, to market really quickly? How do you build it? How do you analyze it? How do you perform a, um, a review on its, on its design? Uh, how do you iterate on that design? How do you work together? How do you get together collaboratively in a really powerful way that goes beyond what we are capable of doing via video conferencing technology? Healthcare, somewhat self-explanatory, a lot here to do with the training of, of clinical staff. Uh, but also to do with the outcomes that come from being able to provide better healthcare service, from being able to provide information relating to patients that improve healthcare. And then we have development and training, and this is a massive area for virtual reality as well, one that we're seeing a lot of uh, startups and vendors enter the market with products dedicated solely to XR around the, the training space. Next up, we have process improvements. So everything to do with remote assistance, for example, being able to help people uh, remotely by effectively dialing in and seeing what they can see and, and annotating on their real world, what button they need to press, what wire they need to cut, what door or they need to open and so on. And then finally, the retail and consumer worlds, perhaps better understood because it's in the media quite a lot, but uh, this is all to do with how do you enhance sales of products? And this actually connects a little bit to, to B2B as well in industry because virtual reality and augmented reality allow us to get a better picture of the value of products without actually having to travel or without having to deal with the logistics of bringing those items to customers or to trade shows and so on. So this is a little bit from uh, reality check here. But um, I wanted to put down on paper exactly where are we seeing value here? Now, later presentations, I'm sure we'll dig into the numbers and give you some case studies relating to specific um, applications of the technologies. But if you look across the functions of an organization, you can find so many uh, important business outcomes that relate to implementing this technology and enterprise. So whether it's you know, improving the efficiency of training and learning and development, um, or whether it is reducing the time and cost of creating physical prototypes and improving the, the speed with which you go to market, improving the alignment of your design vision of a, of a physical product, um, or even in sales and marketing, being able to open up new revenue channels with consumers, create greater engagement with your customers and increase those conversion rates XR has a lot of potential across a number of different functions and quite frankly has applications across 
every single industry, including in maritime and shipbuilding. Virtual collaboration is one that I'm particularly excited about, and it's one that we use at PwC as well. This is an anonymized version of a workshop that we ran um, with our people and with a client in the oil and gas industry. Um, and you can see here, using virtual reality it allows us to enter a different type of of workshop, one where we're able to look around, where we're able to take care of three dimensions and, and use those three dimensions in a way that is very difficult to do you, using video conferencing and is less engaging and less impactful uh, because here we're able to actually be together and feel like we're sharing the same experience. A lot of people say that uh, that's all well and good, but you can't scale virtual reality. The fact is, with enough effort, you can certainly scale virtual reality. This is uh, a video that I took uh, a few weeks ago from um, one of our uh, rooms just on this floor, actually. Uh, and there are 200 virtual reality headsets in that, uh, in that video there. And we deployed them to uh, 200 people, business leaders around the world in 42 countries. Um, and it was very successful in bringing those people together on a leadership training program, as well as running through a number of um, training courses uh, relating to, uh, to their objectives. Some of you may have seen this, but for those who haven't, we also conducted a study specifically into the value of virtual reality when it comes to training. And this was soft skills training in particular. Um, and I won't go into the detail now because we don't have a lot of time. But if you're interested, you can check it out using the link at the, the bottom right hand corner there. And I'm sure Dimitri will be able to hand it over to you afterwards. But this is kind of the executive summary of where we got to at the end of the study. We compared virtual reality training to e-learning and to classroom training using the same type of content. And we found that virtual reality learners were faster to train. They were more confident in applying what they learned. They had more emotional connections to the content. They were more focused. And surprisingly, when you scaled virtual reality up to a high level, you actually gained a cost effectiveness over classroom training. So at 3,000 learners, you reached this 52% figure there in terms of more cost effective than classroom training. And you can see that here actually on the graph. On the x-axis, we have the number of learners here. On the y-axis, we have the cost per learner. And initially, as you would expect, you know, we're trying to build virtual reality training. It starts off quite high per learner, but very quickly after a few hundred learners, it achieves cost parity with, uh, with classroom training at 375 learners. It's the same cost per learner. And then even with e-learning, once you get up to 1,950 learners, it achieves cost parity with that training modality as well. So that's all well and good, great theory, interesting studies, outlook into the future, but what about the here and now? Who is actually using this technology right now in industry? That was another question that we wanted to answer. And to do that, it's a little bit difficult because most people would turn to surveys and surveys are okay, but they wouldn't get us the depth of or the breadth of information even that we pursued using this methodology that we did. So what we did is we analyzed publicly available information on 7.2 million UK and US businesses. So we looked at their websites, we looked at their annual reports, we looked at their blog posts, their social media posts, and anything else we could scrape in terms of data on the public web. Every time we found a, a call out to a keyword like virtual reality, augmented reality, spatial computing, XR, immersive technologies, and the like. We brought in that, um, that case and analyzed it using a natural language processing algorithm. And that allowed us to understand, is this business just talking about XR as something that is you know, cool or interesting, or are they actually using it in their business right now? And we filtered for that latter case, so where businesses are actually using the technology. And where we found that, we applied the lens of, well, are they using it from a VR or AR perspective technology? Where is this company based in the UK? What region or in the US, what state? So that was the geographical lens. In terms of industry, 
what industry is this company that's using XR part of? And then finally, the use case or application, in what area are they using XR? For what purpose are they using this technology? And this is kind of an executive summary of where we've gotten to. There are there's a there's a lot of back end data behind this, but this is this is kind of the uh, the key results here. We found that there are thousands of live applications of this technology being used right now. So in the UK we got over one and a half thousand. In the US we came close to breaching 2,200 unique examples of the technology being used. And from an industry perspective, it was it was really interesting here. The number one in industry in both the UK and the US in terms of using this technology or in terms of the examples that we found um, across the internet was engineering and manufacturing. And maritime and shipbuilding would come under uh, that industry in the subsections that we, we built. So as a percentage, it's not even by, we're not even talking about one to 2% over the, the second biggest year. We're talking about it by a long way. So in the UK, uh, almost a quarter of those examples that we found were within the engineering and manufacturing industry. The next biggest area, retail and consumer, was 11%. So there was an increase of, of 13% to get from retail and consumer to engineering and manufacturing. In the US, it was it was slightly closer. There's about 6% difference there. But in both cases, a, a fantastic um, outlook or understanding about how much engineering and manufacturing has invested and continues to invest in XR technology. If anyone's interested, it may not come as too much of a surprise, but the regional analysis of those applications revealed that the key users in the in the UK for XR technology, in terms of companies that um, had registered um, uh, headquarters, they were mostly based in London. So a third of all those examples were related to companies based in London. And in the US, it was also about a third um, leading the way, and they were based in California. Um, this doesn't contain all the US states, of course. There were too many to put on a pie chart, but any all the states where there was greater than uh, had greater than four percent representation we put on here and then when it came to comparing how many are using virtual reality versus augmented reality the picture was also quite consistent across both the uk and the us here almost two-thirds in both cases were using virtual reality technology right now um, and a third or a little bit more than a third in the us we're using augmented reality technology specifically. And I think the reason for that is it shows the, the level of maturity that virtual reality has gotten to right now in that it can be deployed in enterprise, it can be used in organizations. And that's not to say that augmented reality can't, but I think there's, um, there's a lot of waiting until augmented reality uh, improves even more before we see greater widespread usage across the enterprise. And the great thing here is these figures, when I talk about thousands of applications, these are the absolute minimum figures representing XR adoption in the world for three reasons. One, we only analyze publicly available information. So any organization that wasn't talking very loudly about their use of the technology wasn't included in these numbers. Anything we found that was not B2B, so in other words, it was a direct to consumer application that was deliberately excluded. And then finally, this were, represented a snapshot view from mid 2020 when we conducted the analysis. So by now we're talking about, you know, six to nine months on, these figures will have increased even more. Dimitri already mentioned this, but um, I will I'll very quickly touch upon it. The um, reality check book that uh, he talked about, if anyone doesn't win it at the end of this, you can still get it for 20% off. I've managed to convince the publisher to get you a discount code. So if you just enter Vertalis20 um, at the publisher's website, so koganpage.com, um, they'll be able to, uh, uh, you'll be able to get 20% off the book's price. And there you'll have access to a load of case studies about the technology. We'll talk a lot about the misconceptions. There'll be deep dives into the business value of it with some data-backed arguments as well. 
Um, and then the final things I will leave you with, because we've still got uh, a few minutes left, are some things that I'm seeing right now. And one of them is that standalone headsets, uh, in other words, headsets that don't require a connection to a, an external peripheral system like a computer, uh, they are really showing a lot of dominance right now. The majority of, of our customers are requesting um, virtual reality headsets for use with their applications. Um, and it's understandable when you think about the, 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 the frictionless experience it represents and the ease with which you can distribute a lot of these headsets. One, the one-to-one -one model of deploying headsets is not quite there yet. So currently we're doing uh, a, a one-to-many model where one headset is being used by many people with suitable sanitization procedures, of course, especially given the current COVID climate. Uh, but this idea of the one-to-one -one model, the back-end work is being done in organizations to manage this. In other words, getting the headsets online in device management systems so that IT departments can control them, so that they can be assigned to users, so that they can have the right certificates to allow them onto the enterprise networks. That is all being done and worked through at the moment. So over the next few years, I'm expecting to start to see uh, movement towards this one-to-one -one model where, and I know we were talking to, uh, to John earlier about uh, you know, VR um, back in the day, but it is definitely, it's definitely come on a long way. And uh, in terms of everyday usage alongside applications like Excel, Word, we will hopefully see remote collaboration software, remote assistance software, um, even perhaps training software in the same vein. In terms of augmented reality, if anyone's interested, there are over the 2 billion mobile devices now capable of high-end augmented reality. And that is probably why a lot of organizations are pursuing a mobile device first strategy when it comes to augmented reality versus um, wearable technology. But no doubt wearable technology is also going through a hell of a lot of improvements um, and makes a lot of sense for a lot of organizations depending on the use case. And then finally, I mentioned this uh, before, but Apple's investment in XR, we're all expecting to pay very, uh, strong dividends when this headset actually releases. Um, this is a, it's a sounding board of confidence to the market in general. Um, and, and this is for the B2B market as well as the B2C market, that this technology should be taken seriously. Um, it is being used all over the world right now, regardless of, of Apple or any other company's investment. So it's fantastic to see such strong adoption figures. And uh, thank you all for listening. If anyone has any questions, I think I'll let, um, I'll let Dimitri know if, uh, if I can answer them. And uh, if I can, I'm more than happy to with however much time we've got left. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. And uh, <clears throat> to our audience, uh, please uh, feel free to, uh, uh, to um, share any questions. I see a couple of left and right popping, popping up. So, so Jeremy, um, I mean, question on our end. So, also on the the engineering and manufacturing world. I mean, I was really impressed to see. Uh, I mean, the adoption numbers that you just shared. Can you reflect uh, a bit on that? Can you explain why this seems? Yeah, they seem to be quite far ahead. Is there? I think so. I think there are, there are two reasons for this. One is that engineering and manufacturing has long been a proponent of uh, of XR technology. If you go mm -hmm. back, um, a lot of businesses as as early as the late '90s, early 2000s, have been using the technology just in its its early form. But even back then, they were seeing value from the technology. And that goes on to my second point, in that there is a lot of there is a lot of strong potential in engineering and manufacturing uh, because of the the physical element of the of the work involved when you're looking at training someone to perform a hands-on task um, virtual reality lends itself very well to that where you're looking to help someone with a task in the real world augmented reality can assist with that uh, when you are looking at trying to understand a 
it could be anything. It could be the design of a ship, a vehicle, um, a building, an asset of some sort. When you are trying to give stakeholders a one-to-one -one scale view of what this would be like, it's extremely difficult and challenging without without implementing and embracing virtual reality technology because it's all well and good showing that as a CAD model on a 2D screen, probably, you know, if it's a laptop like mine, a 13 inch 2D screen, yeah. that doesn't give you the sense of scale that you need to understand and the sense of immersion that often helps with trying to figure out whether there have been any errors in the production or more importantly, whether there will be any errors during the manufacturing process, which can be incredibly costly if they're realized after that takes place. So I think in summary, in engineering manufacturing, there is there is just so much potential there in terms of the applications. There is a lot of, uh, there is a massive business case, a strong business case, and no doubt the presenters after me will, will back this up with, uh, with their numbers about what they're seeing. But at a macro level, that's what I'm seeing in terms of the value that it provides to engineering and manufacturing. Thanks a lot, Jeremy, and uh, thanks for sharing the data, the updates, etc. I know you have to leave for another meeting, so um, pleasure having you on board. I mean, we will collect your questions and put them forward into uh, to the panel discussion as well, and I will make sure you get a copy and we'll relay those questions to you as well. Yeah, that's no problem at all. If if anyone wants to uh, to ask a question that they they thought about afterwards, I have no problem with that. Just let Dimitri know, and we'll we'll handle those questions offline. But um, otherwise, thanks a lot for inviting me, and thank Excellent. you everyone for listening. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, get on. Can we bring up the profile and introduction of uh, Dennis? Because we are going to go to our next session and um and and so please keep on adding questions so we will collect them and uh, bring them forward to our panel so we have dennis uh, co-ceo at ssi who spent um, i think over 20 years working in this industry so we're going to get going to a deep dive now into uh shipbuilding shipyards uh, and manufacturing industry he's worked uh, with clients all over the world and ssi is a industry partner of vitalis and they basically help uh, ship builders solve the most complex business problems and technology problems dennis is um well internationally recognized for his blogs articles and and, and, and papers and um, so when we transfer the uh, presentation to Dennis, uh, there's an interesting fact uh, I would like to share with the audience, which I found out the other day, that at home and at work, Dennis is known as Superman. It's not because of his fear of kryptonite, but it's because he believes that anyone can become as impressive as, and as, impressive as, uh, as Superman. And, uh, Dennis, there's no better introduction than um, than this Superman thing. So I hope we can um, see a little bit of your uh, laptop's background with the Superman logo. And if not, let's get started on the uh, on your presentation. Uh, take it off. Thanks. There you go. There it is. There you go. There you oh, go. I wasn't going to show it, but since it was an introduction, I, ha I had. To. <laughs> and you can read a little bit more into that, where we all have the dark side, but. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, so um, as I was been introduced, my name is uh, Dennis Mori. I'm the co-CEO of SSI. And today I'll be giving you a, um, say a quick presentation on XR and shipbuilding. It is going to be, um, sorry, one second here. Uh, it is gonna be a little bit more business focused uh, than pure technology. Um, just because I think you know the the cooler portion of the technology in XR will be handled by the, the co-presenters after, which would probably be able to articulate it a lot better than myself. So um, the items that I want to talk about in this uh, presentation is I want to talk a little bit about uh, the foundation or the, the data information, which is the foundational of any XR or, or any digital initiative. 
um, because it gives you more context of how that has affected our past trends as well as how it will affect our current trends, which will be what I'll also be talking about in this presentation. So start off with always this uh, digital ship uh, slide, which has um, quite a bit of information. And, and if we look at um, all the information we require to build a ship, we know that there's a, a lot. And this data uh, or in, information is created throughout the whole entire life cycle of the ship. And if we think of any phase that we're in, we're going to be using data that was generated in a previous phase, as well as the data that we're going to be generating is going to be consumed from a later phase. So if we look at any digital initiative that any organization has for their business or digital transformation, it all revolves around this data. And also when we're talking about data and information, there's two different aspects that I, I want to to distinguish but also to make sure that everyone uh, um, understands where I'm coming from and I talk about information as content and intent and to kind of use the the marketing buzzwords we, we talk about digital twin and digital thread and content of the data is what we would think of you know the 3d data um, the bill and material data manuals um, even IOT data and the intent the why of the data is the connection of uh, the connection between the information and it could be the connection between this information and data but in the same phase but also across the life cycle of the vessel so when i'm talking about inf information and the information that is driving our in innovations our digital innovations uh, it's about the content and intent so when we look at this information and where this information is going to be stored you know, we've long passed the, the, the philosophy or the thought that we would be able to hold all our data in one platform, that we know that we are going to be storing all this data, again, throughout the entire life cycle of the vessel across uh, multiple platforms. So this is something that I, I call a, a platform, a platform approach. So this digital ship, this digital thread strategy that has all this data is going to be stored in multiple different platforms. And to add a little more complexity, but it is somewhat still the reality, is these platforms are not going to be stored in one organization. So all this information is going to be stored in multiple different platforms, but these platforms are going to be spread across many different organizations and companies. And to add a little one more dimension into this, which adds a little more complexity, but it is the reality that we're in, is that these platforms are going to be created by different software vendors. So if you really think about the, the situation that is that we're in, is that for any digital initiative that we were pushing, including XR, the data that is driving it is contained in multiple different platforms across multiple different organizations and the software vendors that are creating the information and storing this uh, information in the platforms are created by different vendors. So when we look at XR, um, XR is pretty much a piece of this whole entire ecosystem. It is a, uh, an, uh, you can consider it a platform that would have to connect with other platforms to collect this information, to consume as well as distribute information. So in this ecosystem, it, pretty much your information has to be you know, free and liberated. You can't really hold your data hostage. But that's how I see XR fitting into the whole, let's say shipbuilding, but also a business ecosystem. So we start now more with trends. And if you're like me, you read a lot and hear a lot of some of the great and interesting uh, successes in our industry, um, as well as you, you can see a lot more in, in other industries. And there's a lot of good examples. I know Newport News here in, in the US uh, has a lot of good examples of AR. There's a lot of uh, companies in, I believe in India that has, that has actually taken VR as a, a requirement when they're doing new projects. There's a lot of and yacht builders and, and luxury vessels that have done a lot with VR. Uh, BAE has done a lot. They presented quite a bit on that. And even with AR, I think uh, the first time I actually presented on AR with in you've been using the Japanese yard was about four or five years ago. So they've been using it for quite a while. The thing about um, with all these great successes that, that you know again we hear about and read about that we shouldn't really interpret them as a representation of the shipbuilding industry. 
Um, so even though there's some great potential with XR, the successes that we're really seeing are really the successes of these early adopters and not really a true reflection of the majority of the industry. So these early adopters and, and innovators have really pushed through and demonstrated uh, the value of XR, but again, we need to recognize the, the amount of effort and resources and even pain that they all really invested in it. However, their successes, but more importantly, their failures is something that we can really learn from and is one of the reasons why there's actually a um, huge trend and even interest in our industry to leverage XR. So if I was gonna say today, um, our industry is at a point of trying to cross this, this chasm. Um, where we know the technology is ready for shipbuilding uh, and there's some really good examples used in a production environment but and well and majority of the risk has already been taken again from the, the innovators and early adopters which again is why uh, many organizations are seriously considering uh, an XR solution for their digital or business transformation. So if we spend some time looking at some of the past trends with XR um, in, in shipbuilding for the main reason of learning from them. Again, there was a lot of successes and failures uh, from these innovators and early adopters, uh, so why not learn from them? Um, so in, in the innovators and early adopter phase, uh, there's usually a lot more investment of time and resource. Time because it takes time to implement it, you know, to validate it, um, to fail, uh, to learn and you know, rinse and repeat as well as I would say even the cost of XR solutions were probably a little more expensive you know, back in the day than they are now. But this is uh, why you're seeing specific segments that have adopted XR, such as the Navy with uh, submarines and aircraft carriers. You see a lot to do with cruise ships, you see offshore rigs, uh, even luxury builders such as yacht builders leverage XR. And the reason is the value of a good XR solution is much higher for them so it makes more business sense for them to invest more time and resources than other segments. So if you actually look at majority of the examples that we see and read about, they're mostly related to those segments because the value versus effort is a, is a lot higher. Um, so when we look at XR, XR is still perceived um, as a cost in technology and not really let's say an investment in strategy with a lot of the uh, executives still kind of seeing it a little bit of an entertainment factor rather than a value to the business. Um, and this is why we saw many of the initial implementations to get off the ground had to have programs or subsidized projects from various different sources, governments and, and, and so forth. Um, but also a, a challenge that we, we saw was that, um, and we probably continue to have, is how do we calculate and justify ROI? And it's always one of those things that sounds easy because you know you make you know one mistake and they, they can pay for the whole investment but the reality is is from an executive or decision maker perspective they hear that comment with many of the other technologies that they are really competing with um, xr for time and, and resources another trend um, is if you look at most of the successes again in shipbuilding um, with XR, the models are what I would say are, are static models or we'll say snapshots in time. You know, so for example, if you look at the training use cases, which probably has had the most uh, success, um, they are really using a final version of the model. Um, but also if you look at sales presentation uh, and a lot of those use cases, uh, production floor, even with the ARs that we see with it in some of the Japanese yards, um, they're all using a snapshot model strategy. And this is not bad by itself. Um, but it's something that we need to recognize as it is much easier to solve the use cases that does not need a model to change very often. Um, you know, creating a, a solution that requires changes to be propagated in a timely manner is extremely more complicated. And the faster you want that to be propagated, the more difficult it would be. Um, however, the, the challenge of propagating change is being overcome with some of the current tools that, that uh, we're seeing in the industry. Um, so last is, uh, so even though we've seen a lot of these great um, examples come from these uh, POCs or proof of concepts, um, there were a lot more proof of concepts that failed than succeeded. And this is understandable to a certain extent, um, but I do feel that there was more failures than we should have had, or in other words, there could have been some failures that we've, we avoided. 
And the reason for this higher, higher failure rate was not because of the technology, but it was rather the approach, the way that we approached it, and which is really a, a common mistake, um, an error that we actually make when we're implementing a lot of our digital initiatives in the shipbuilding industry. And the focus was more on implementing a cool technology uh, rather than solving a business problem. So in other words, we're, you know, many of the pr proof of concepts were looking for a problem to solve rather than using the technology to solve a business problem. And this could make sense in other industries that are, I would say, more on the bleeding edge of technology. But with shipbuilding, which is, you know, let's say pushing the, the cutting edge of technology, really allows us to start from a business problem rather than uh, from a technology. And it kind of seems obvious um, that it is extremely important to, to define the goals before you're trying to, uh, to uh, create your POC, but there was a lot that didn't really have clear goals or really vague goals. You know, they didn't know if they were, you know, creating a solution for the owner operator, if they're creating it for to help set the sales and sales presentations, if it was going to help ergonomics or design reviews. And if it was design reviews, what type of design reviews? Because each type of design review has different characteristics and different needs. Is it going to be used for training or we'll say even shipyard layout and optimization or validation of manufacturing, uh, construction and uh, assembly visualization and that allows feedback and we'll even say the elusive uh, digital twin with uh, connection to IoT. And the thing is XR will add value to any of those goals, but we really needed to focus on the business, uh, the biggest business uh, need for our business, which each business will have unique goals for them. Because as you guys know, the time and resources is our most precious thing and we just can't focus on all these things. We really need to be focused on the one or two things that would add value. So. And I do want to spend a little bit more time talking about um, the trends of the uh, previous POCs and the challenges that we um, that we face on moving from the proof of concept into the production environment, as I think it'd be a good, you know, we can get some good lessons and we can learn from it. Also, I think uh, it will provide a lot of the context of the current trends that we're seeing, uh, which I will touch base on uh, the next slide. So. The, the creation of uh, innovation silos is um, an interesting concept that I uncovered when working with many of our clients uh, on you know, their business and digital transformation, which again also relates with XR. And the source ca cause of this innovation silo is because since there's a lot of data already in our current ecosystem, but it is scattered across, uh, this bit, uh, across your business. And this information that we need to drive XR or digital initiative is not in a format, um, nor do we have the relationships that, between the data that we that we require. So what happens is to get this information to be available to be used for our digital initiative uh, XR solution, is that there had to be a bunch of pre-processing of the data to get it into a format that again can drive our, our solution and that the XR um, tool would be able to consume. As well as there was a lot of pre-processing data that happened in the XR platform so that it can leverage the data and you know build business logic and so forth. So this was great to prove the concept, um, but when they were trying to transition transition this into a production environment, um, all these ad hoc pre-processing -process steps did not really meet the, the robustness, the performance, uh, the consistency that we require for a production environment. And this is why we see uh, most of these implementations using a static model because if you're doing these pre-processing before and after, if you're just doing it once, it's okay. But if you have to do it multiple times, the value versus effort doesn't uh, equation does not work out very well. Um, so handling change effectively kind of relates to uh, the previous statement. Um, so when you're conducting a, a proof of concept or a proof of concept, um, the, it's really in a controlled environment, uh, which doesn't really have the realities, we'll say, of uh, the current project and you know that it consistently changes. Um, and again, as we kind of mentioned, how fast the change needs to propagate through the XR solution really depends on the type of problem that you're solving, which again is important to identify your goals that you're trying to achieve. Um, so simply put, many POCs that required change to be propagated didn't really spend appropriate amount of time on validating that use case. So they focus on a, a simple change um, and 
you know, made sure it pushed through, but really did not validate the frequency that the change had to be propagated. So third, um, so some of these uh, proof of concepts concentrated on a specific track of XR, um, which is typical, such as, you know, VR, but it didn't really consider or even define, we'll say, an overall visualization strategy. And the outcome of this was that they created another way to interact with your model, which has a completely different user experience. And this really made it hard for the end users to adopt, uh, as well as it made it very complicated from the business to keep multiple visualization technology stacks and, and workflows in sync between uh, each other. And uh, the best, or yeah, the best example I usually give is with how they dealt with uh, collaboration, which is one key use case of XR. Um, so you would have a collaboration session with various different stakeholders, uh, which they could be local, they could be global, uh, they could be using you know, different types of devices. And one common output that you have from a collaboration session is comments. And comments most likely have a action item. So the challenge that many faced was these comments uh, with these action items stayed in the XR environment. Uh, and that would have been fine if you're managing these, if you're managing these action items as well as actioning these items in that environment. However, we know that this is usually not the case. So what happened is that they had to take screenshots uh, and then add these uh, to items in another system, such as you know, a PLM system that would be able to manage these comments uh, by ECO or, or whatever workflow you have, as well as the user that had to action the change in the CAD authoring tool was also using a different visualization tool. So they had to use screenshots. As you can imagine, this is not really very efficient and not really what we intended or desired. And this was definitely something that has slowed the adoption um, and in some cases killed it from when moving uh, from a, a proof of concept into production in some of those use cases that they had. Uh, and last but definitely not least is the integration with other business systems. Um, so in a lot of cases, there were some light integrations that again, had a lot of pre-processing data. Again, this was fine from a proof of concept perspective, but when they tried to move this into a production environment, uh, the integrations were just not mature enough. And this was not because of technology, um, but it was more about the messiness of data uh, in the environment, as well as the, the ecosystem that they had with many different tools and so forth. So if we um, and now look at the trends of the industry um, that we, we're seeing now, um, and many of them should be pretty much obvious as you know they're, they're kind of formulated and created uh, from the challenges that we uncovered in, in the previous slides. And the first very strong trend uh, we're seeing are organizations are focusing on their information, they're getting their information under control. And this is not just because of XR, but rather the realization that you know any digital strategy that they want to be able to move forward with requires their data and relationships to be consumable. So as we saw with the previous challenges uh, that, that we faced, um, you know, from moving from the proof of concepts into production, majority of the challenges was because we simply just did not have a good handle on, on their data. And I know data is not sexy. I know it's not as cool as the VR and a lot of these AR uh, uh, technologies that we're, we're kind of implementing. I know it'll take time, but the reality is it is really the foundation of any digital uh, initiative, including any XR strategy. So this is not to say that you need to get all your data organized to start any of your initiatives, but you need at least to need to understand um, what your information strategy is, as well as that any digital initiative that you have, such as XR, will, will have to consume information and distribute information in that platform, if you will. So once you have a data foundation platform strategy, if you will, you only focus on putting the information in there that will drive your digital initiative. So when you have your digital initiative, you, you put your information for it in your uh, information platform. When you have another one, it can uh, leverage that information already. If it requires other information, it, you would then start populating more information into that, uh, into that platform. So you're slowly building the information platform in more of an agile goal focused uh, um, strategy, which kind of goes into my uh, next point and the next trend that we're seeing, uh, which is being 
uh, more goal focused, uh, you know, and we'll see with the agile implementation. And there is just a lot more intentional effort uh, and awareness uh, to be more disciplined for the projects that we pursue. And this is especially coming from shipbuilding, uh, where we're kind of going more scattered before. And there's just so many opportunities that we have today in, in, in the shipbuilding industry, as well as many other industries, that it really makes it hard for us to be focused. However, as we know, any company that wants to succeed in the future really needs to learn how to be focused. Because as the saying goes, is uh, if we don't prioritize what is important, only the, the unimportant stuff gets done. And if we look at uh, almost every one in our industry, they have kind of a you know a vision, the core of the vision, they have digital twin, digital ship, digital shipyard, all that good stuff. And XR will be part of attaining that vision. It's really hard to attain that vision without having a good XR strategy. But even though with XR, there's many problems that it can solve, and we really need to make sure that we are prioritizing the value of those solutions to the, from a business perspective. So every business, depending on what's important, will prioritize it uh, differently. And because um, in essence, again, using another quote saying here, sorry, but uh, you know, we, we can do anything that we want, but we just can't do everything that we want. So people are really trying to be focused uh, on what business problems that they're solving and then adding you know, the information they require to their information platform to drive these initiatives and building that platform as more initiatives come, come online. The third one and another trend is, um, is also looking at a more holistic visualization strategy with we'll say a visualization platform, which can handle uh, majority of the heavy lifting of uh, visualization, but also collaboration, um, as well as it would create a uh, consistent UX across the organization. So this is not to say that every single visualization will be handled by your visualization platform. So for, so for example, if you have other business systems, your PLM, your ERP, your MES systems, uh, for example, um, they will also have a way to visualize a portion of the model. But the heavy lifting of visualization, uh, visual, visualizing a larger section of your ship with some uh, um, business logic, as well as supporting the multiple different devices that we have from mobile and, and headsets and tablets and desktops and caves and goggles and HoloLens and all that, as well as provide an integrated collaboration um, would ideally be held with your visualization platform. So the ability to also handle change um, and have it propagated through the environment is also being attempted to be uh, solved using this visualization platform. Because the thought is if the visualization platform can handle the change, uh, then any other digital initiative that, that uses the, the visualization platform will also uh, uh, automatically have up-to-date information in the environment and the device that they want, right? So you're doing it once and it, any initiative, you can just keep on reusing that data. But also, again, the, the importance of this, the change being propagated really depends on your, your goals. So go to step number two first. But also the, the visualization platform is, is, is also trying to be connected to other business systems. Um, so mostly we'll say initially as more of a consumption and then ideally it is a, a bi-direction. And the benefit is again, the same as having the visualization platform being connected to propagate change is that once it's connected to, you know, in this platform or platform ecosystem to other platforms and has access to this information, then any digital initiative that requires that information would be able to leverage it and not have to do through, go through that whole work again of getting that information into that format and creating the, the information silo challenge that we had before. Uh, last but not least is uh, to have a secure and seamless um, collaboration workflow. And as we kind of mentioned, you know, one of the benefits of XR is um, to collaborate with other stakeholders. And especially in today's environment, um, there's a, a trend that we need to find the best way possible to collaborate with stakeholders across the globe, which poses several unique security and performance issues. Um, so they want to be able to, to collaborate on a model in real time, you know, synchronously or as well as asynchronously without increasing the risk of giving away your model, or in other words, giving away your IP, which is very, very important. So there's, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of focus on that. Another area that has focus that they wanna overcome is the, the challenge of um, 
of the disconnected comments and markups between platforms. Um, so there is definitely a trend of trying to connect all these comments and markups between all these different platforms, um, but mostly being trying to be managed more on your information uh, platform, which would also be this unified view of all your, your action items and, and comments. But this is a very difficult problem people are looking at right now, and I'm not sure if there will be a good solution that will be implemented in you know you know a year or two this is a very tough problem on keeping the comments and the collaboration in each of the systems including the xr but also having a way that we can kind of connect them to and create items such as ecos and action item action uh, them as well so so thank you very much uh, i'm not sure where i'm on my time but hopefully that uh, uh, provided some insight from a little bit higher of a, of a business perspective um, and yeah I'll, I'll be here to the end so if there's any questions I'll be happy to uh, answer some questions and I would even be more happy to, to learn something that you guys are doing. Thank you Dennis and uh, and uh, also thanks for managing the time because I think we are uh, spot on so uh, oh, thanks very much so uh, so I know you will be joining long, but yeah, well, that's uh, you know, thanks for sharing so many uh, insights uh, and trends and doing that in 25 minutes. I mean, what you presented is so relevant for uh, for this industry. And um, so my suggestion is um, because Dennis will be joining us for the panel. Panel is open for discussion. So uh, please share your questions as well. I would like to have, ask you only one question before we move on to the next one. And uh, and you mentioned um, you did the adoption life cycle, you know, the early adopters, and and that we are actually moving to the phase of more, we call it early majority, and towards more mass adoption. So my question is, um, how many years will it take? And you presented this boat moving from left to right. How many years will it take to? to get into that, that next level of uh, the adoption curve? Uh, well, that's, that's a really good question. And I, as a lot of my team knows, I'm, I'm, I tried not to do the prediction um, mm -hmm. area, but it's very, very of difficult. Uh, and you're guaranteed to be wrong. Um, but I, I, the whole thing is, I, I think I, I, I pretty much see the trend of just getting at the beginning of it. But where we would be from the early adopters uh, or the early majority, even in the middle of that, um, yeah. It, it, I think it's still years away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I um, accept it, and yeah. uh, and that's uh, point taken. So uh, the interesting thing is, and for many of us on the on this on this webinar, and by the way, I'm very happy that all of you, and thanks to Dennis, are hanging in there, staying on, and and uh, and uh, actually the number of attendees are are increasing. But but uh, Jeremy told us as a quote, he said, listen, it, it will become, maybe it's not today, but more a kind of go digital or die, go XR or die. It's probably early, but it will become such a critical uh, uh, competence, capability, and we will also address it in the Vitalis session, I know that. I mean, it will become more and more uh, important, and at some point of time, you cannot yeah, leave out. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I'll see you, we'll see you later at the, the panel. So thanks a lot. So um, let me uh, introduce the um, the Vitalis speakers and, and sessions. And uh, and again, thanks to Dennis, because he, he presented a couple of pointers, uh, topics, uh, which will are very nice intros for the um, uh, Vitalis um, folks, uh, John, and Paul to talk about. Now, by collaborative XR is one thing I wrote down, uh, but also what we see happening uh, at our customers. And I know that also Paul will share uh, some uh, interesting ROI data. Um, so let me introduce briefly, because we'll keep it short. We'll, we are also modest. I mean, we're all colleagues over here and, uh, and many of our own customers are in here. And, and they know some of us, but still briefly for the record. So, uh, so Paul um, joined us 15 years ago uh, with an engineering and marketing background, but his VR experience is actually even longer. So he's in this domain for 17 years. He's currently working in the systems 
and solution environment, managing uh, uh, the team and supporting customers around the world, designing, delivering the most effective VR systems. Um, so Paul, I think I'll like to hand over to you. Uh, and when I take it back, then I'd like to do a short uh, demo about collaborative XR, and then we move to, to John. So Paul, please. Thank you. Um... I just want to say a big thank you to Dimitri for the introduction and of course to Jeremy and Dennis. It was great uh, to get the benefit of your experience and hear your views on what's going on. Um, Dimitri, you asked me to share something fun about yes. myself. Um, well, I thought about a photograph, to be honest. And um, just like the VR industry, I'm not new. Um, wow. When I saw this picture of myself um, doing the Tough Mudder, which is an obstacle course race, I was a little horrified wow. until I remembered that um, some of those, you know, those harmless looking orange cables that are around me are carrying 10,000 volts and I was dripping wet. So um, thankfully my engineering um, knowledge tells me that it's the current that kills, volts just hurt. <laughs> However. <laughs> like like Tough Mudder, I guess my, my career in VR has taught me quite a few things, and we'll talk about some of the things we've experienced um, in the coming slides. So, But unlike me, the XR industry is being refreshed every day. I mean, there's something new coming along every day, a new headset, a new piece of software. Yeah. Um, if that analogy was applied to me, by the way, I think I'd be the bionic man by now. <laughs> so... So the real story, um, Vitalis, what are we? What are we doing? Well, um, we've been involved with the uh, VR industry for um, 30 years. We've been deriving additional benefits from visualizing CAD across um, a multitude of markets for a very long time now. And in fact, there was 20 years of that time of being, we've been spent working in the shipbuilding industry. Um, it's, it's really important to look at optimizing the data, um, getting that data into a visualization environment, um, getting those results that you're seeing collaborative, sharing those around your industry. And I want to go through a couple of examples with you where people have done that. So, our target as Fertilist is to solve people's problems, solve our clients' problems through the use of visualization and visualization of that complex um, CAD data. So typically, we would be approached by our clients in one or two disciplines. Um, it might be in a design review team. Um, they want to uh, look at bigger data sets. They want to combine multiple data sets from different sources. Um, they might be wanting to work out their build process, um, their factory planning, their layouts, their production lines. They also often come to us with um, requests about training. Or, uh, so how do we make our training more effective? How do we make it more efficient? Or marketing, how do we get to market earlier? How do we put new products in front of people before we've actually built one? One of the things people always forget is the decommissioning side. Decommissioning is a big part of the product life cycle. How do we get the product dismantled and taken away um, more efficiently? And here at the, the Tars, we're really driven um, to help our clients solve these problems. We, what we produce are the tools to help you do that. And this often involves building a tailored solution. So. Um, optimizing your data with some software, enabling the visualization of that data with a software package, and then putting that up into an immersive review or a collaborative communication um, of that data through visualization. But it generally starts with a discrete project. Um, solving and uh, proving it is a very, uh, very good way uh, of starting your XR journey. If you can do it in a measurable way, prove that it works, it's a great way of starting. However, I think as Dennis has just said, 
it's most effective um, when you use it right across the enterprise and you leverage that data across a number of different disciplines. You get cost being spread, you get the use of systems and solutions being maximized and the benefits get multiplied. Um, some of the most effective implementations we've seen with XR is um, when we uh, they put XR at the heart of a business. So an example of just how well proven this technology is, is with BAE. BAE have had 20, over 20 years of experience leveraging XR um, throughout the design and manufacturing phases of marine delivery. Um, they have taken careful optimization of their data. They've um, automated the processing, ensuring that current data, and that's absolutely critical, that current data is always visible and making this available in the right place at the right time. And that's had really significant impact. Physical prototypes can be eliminated. Um, the data is provided where and when it's needed, even on the factory floor. And in that photograph, you see a cabin above the black tube. The black tube's a nuclear submarine. The cabin holds a VR suite. So we're actually putting the data right where it's needed. Um, what's more, the engineers lead the design reviews. They can sit in those cabins themselves. They can drive the VR model. And because everyone understands a 3D physical item and it's projected in 3D, presented in 3D, it gives us one common visual language. This saved every engineer 15 minutes per day per shift. And this was time that they would have spent going to the CAD room and pulling down uh, fresh drawings or discussing um, new designs and changes. This meant they got payback inside a month. So we can see this is a really proven, um, stable, uh, value adding solution to a number of problems. Furthermore, one of their other divisions was re reviewing um, investment in their complete visualization technology. It's part of a digital transformation program. So they drew on the inspiration that was given by automotive manufacturers who operate to much shorter design cycles and commissioned a three month VR trial um, for design review and planning. Let me tell you, it was an instant success. So this design review and planning project ended up with the commissioning of a large scale network of interconnected collaborative systems. They started with five, we're up around 24 at the moment. And they invested in CADAware, XR software that was VR, purely fully VR capable and could collaborate across a wide network and bring all of these people together in one place. So the confidence that they gained um, with doing this helped develop significant um, value add and it developed a returned another great return on investment they were able to get the money back in 12 months now this whole process is really deeply embedded in their daily design process and returning very good added value one of the most powerful implementations of XR I've seen in my time at Vitalis was from another industry, in fact. And it's really around the way that one client put visualization at the heart of their business. What they did was build collaborative, um, immersive environments, strategically placed in their businesses, both geographically and physically and virtually and connected them. It was to solve a problem. That problem was um, with an off-road machinery project. Initially, they were building, uh, their groups within the team were designing the product um, in individual groups. This is because the, the vehicle as a whole was complex enough to make running the one CAD model, the combined CAD model on a single terminal, a little unwieldy wasn't very efficient. 
So the chassis seat team would do their work on one machine. Uh, the, the cab team would do their work on another. The electrics um, in theirs and hydraulics, etc. They all had their own way of doing it. They had their own systems of putting it together. But with the introduction of XR systems, they were able to improve that. So from having meetings where they were sitting around a table with 2D drawings and perhaps a CAD terminal, when they were checking fit, form and function and discussing design decisions and making those decisions based around that method, they were finding um, in that process that they were coming up with a few errors, um, which is quite normal. Um, and these errors were, occurred due to misinterpretations or simply an oversight to mention that a part had been moved or upgraded. But in this illustration, um, the CAD team was actually positioned on one side of the VR suite, physically connected to it. And the CAD team, uh, with the introduction of these XR systems and smart software, had the ability to combine all of their sub-projects into one place at one time. They could easily walk from their design team in their groups into the VR suite and review the data. Part clashes and things like uh, accessibility issues became really clear instantly. Design reviews became more productive and decisions were made faster. They didn't stop there. On the other side of the room was the manufacturing facility. Where the designers were ready, they feel they've got a design that they could share. They could open the doors into manufacturing and experts in the manufacturing process were invited in to give their input. Now, of course, they had a completely different perspective of what they wanted to see. They were interested in accessibility for their tools, the ease of assembly, and the manufacturing processes. This was all core to their thinking. But their input could be very easily and quickly incorporated in designs. Once that product was validated in the design and build process, they could call in the marketing team. Marketing team could then share that model to start the, the customer evaluation process and begin building their marketing plans. Then simultaneously, the training uh, department could bring it, could start their um, training processes. So how are they going to build it on the shop floor? How are they going to maintain it in the field? The interesting thing is all of this is being done without a physical model, without a product. It's all in a virtual prototype. Critically, as the product is a virtual prototype, it's something that they could walk around in, virtual, in the virtual world. They could reach out and touch it. They can interrogate it and explore it. And they were all able to use this one common visual language that we've talked about before. But in a final step, they used um, collaboration technologies to share this model globally to some of their other VR suites that they got distributed around the world. And they could do that in real time. Linking together mo multiple teams to communicate effectively and quickly was very, very powerful for them. So, as we've said, it's normal for people to come to us with a unique problem. And in this fast moving world, it's generally about money. They're always targets to getting a result faster and to lower cost than ever before. And that's perfectly understandable. They ask questions like, how do we reduce our design cycle costs? How do we reduce our prototyping costs? How do we train people faster? And more recently, especially with COVID, how do we collaborate across our whole global network between remote offices, people working at home, distributed suppliers and customers? And from experience and measuring and research, we now know we can get where we want faster with XR with fewer errors, with less risk, um, at a lower cost than ever before. And we can collaborate across a global community, um, not only with a business, within a business, but you know, with your entire supply chain. Consequently, we're now beginning to talk to real thought leaders in businesses about planning for step-by-step -step implementation of XR across their whole enterprise. So to close, what do we recommend people do? Well, use these technologies to share data, 
and the vision across multiple disciplines by using a universally understood visual language. It's there, we've got it. XR will provide that for you. In doing this, you can make visibly complex data easy to access, and it can be prepared automate, automatically and very easily. Connect it to your PLM, embed it in your daily process and your reviews. Accuracy of the data is proven, so you can build confidence in that and the resulting decisions that you're going to make. You can be really confident that what you see is what you're going to get. Remember, when we put VR or XR at the heart of the business, when collaborative XR gets there, it can be quick, easy and seamless and we can deliver incredible benefits. OK. Dimitri, back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. I really like the uh, BAE uh, submarine uh, example. I hope that uh, John Martin in, in the panel discussion will elaborate about his uh, journey as well to and perhaps explain how much money they saved when they moved from physical models towards uh, digital models and, and engineering. And, uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I, 70 I think years we'll see that, that, that physical prototype, I think John Martin was uh, telling us, was 14 million pounds. So yeah. it's an instant so, huge leaving. Uh, Paul, thanks. Uh, I will see you um, Professor Beck in the in the panel, uh, John. Um, yeah. I'd like to introduce you. And before we start, um, I'd also like to ask Kitan to run a uh, very short glimpse of uh, Vitalis and collaborative XR and how this looks like. So, um, so John, um, you're in front of us, uh, everyone. You're a senior product manager here at uh, Vitalis and a key member and visionary of the uh, Vitalis REACH team. John started his career as an uh, engineer in the uh, aero and fluid dynamics and uh, transitioned into uh, software product management in uh, 2012 and has been in this uh, field since then. I think in 2019 joined Vitalis uh, managing our software product lines, working closely with customers understanding their requirements and uh, also embedding that in our vision and uh, future uh, roadmap and from that perspective it's a pleasure having you here John so uh, and share all the learnings back into uh, into this uh, forum um, so um, Kethan can you um, run that single video so which we show it for a reason because we also been looking back a little bit but we also like to show you the current state uh, of collaborative XR for all of us to have a starting point and also build on that for the for the panel discussion. So please, um, if you can run it, then um, excellent. Following the input for the cold water, we're coming in from this part, and this is the new section here, is it? Yes, yeah, so this is the part we're expecting from our partner. When are we getting the CAD for that? Should be next week. Right, okay, and are these pipes correct now for that new part, or is that for the old part? No, that's for the new part, so this piping's all correct. Right, okay, because we're not we're missing an alignment here, aren't we? We're sort of we're coming in too high. Oh, yeah, we are. The, those two flanges don't line up correctly. Who designed the pipes? Can we get them in to yeah, so that was discuss? Dave's, Can we uh, adjust these to fit with the chiller? Hopefully. I'll just invite Dave to see if he, if he knows. Hey, Chris. Hey, Tim. How's it going? Hi, Dave. Hello. So, question is, we've got, with a new pipe fitting coming in here, and these new pipes, we're coming in high on the chiller. Can we drop these pipes back, or will the new part is that is that the reason we raised them up? And that is the reason why. The only issue is we had to do that because if we change the height of everything else, it'll be quite a lot of work to move all the pipe work in the rest of the system down, even if it's just a couple of inches. Do you know if it's possible to raise the chiller at all? I 
don't offhand, Chris, do you know? I don't, but uh, let me see if Andy is available and bring him in. Uh, so send him the link. See if he joins. Hello, Chris, you after me? Hi, Andy. Um, yeah, we just got a bit of an issue with the alignment of the pipes to the, the chili that you designed. Uh, Tim, do you want to explain it for him? Yeah, so we've got the new part where the intersection comes in. Um, as the pipe comes in, we're coming in high on the chiller here and on the right, right. return. Um, so can we raise the chiller up to fit that? Because otherwise it's looking like we're going to have to do a lot of work on the pipes. So here and uh, through through there, yeah. Um, I should think so. Let me run some analysis. I'll get the results in the next couple of days. Um and get them to you, but I think that should be okay. Is that all right? Yep, now that sounds fine to me. Great, thanks no guys. Thanks guys. Bye. Cheers all. See Excellent, so John, I'll hand over to, to you, so. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping I'm sharing the correct screen. Yes, good, yes. okay, thank you. Um, interesting presentation so far. I made a, a few notes as we were going along. And one thing that really stood out, um, well, first of all, was that we've each taken a, a different take on, on the subject. Um, Jeremy was taking a largely economic view on the state of XR. Uh, Dennis talked about a number of subjects, but I really noted the emphasis on data and making sure that the right data is accessible and can be updated. And Paul took a, a view on you know, applications and the technology that we have deployed as an organization. And they're all relevant. And I've taken a slightly different view as well. So what I'm going to be looking at when I look at how we can use collaborative XR to really help drive your business uh, is to look at people and processes. So we've got quite a rounded picture. Um, I also have noted that a few of the points I'm going to make have come up before, which is kind of good because it means you know we're all seeing a, a largely synchronized picture. So the first thing I wanted to say was um, XR doesn't have to be hyper-optimized to deliver value. So there is a case for treating XR a little bit like you might bumper uh, reversing sensors on your car. They only need to work once to save you money. And that's not necessarily uh, an easy sell, but it does stack up. We've seen that ourselves. If you just buy it, fit it, you will realize some value from it. But it's not the full story. And if that's all you do, uh, even with the best technology in the world, you will leave a substantial amount of value on the shelf. And to try and illustrate that point, I'm gonna give you, um, it's quite a well-known example, so I apologize if this is a repeat for many of you. But um, back in the middle of the 20th century, the Royal Artillery in Britain realized that they had a problem. They had, their rate of fire for their artillery guns was much slower than a lot of uh, the other nations, and they couldn't figure out why. So they enlisted the help of a time and motion um, professional who came in and looked at their routines for operating the gun to figure out what might be going on, where improvements in efficiencies might come along. And he did this and he took pictures along the way and uh, he looked at the results. And one thing stood out to him, and that was there was a period in this uh, routine where the gunners stood stock still. They would stand still for three seconds and effectively do nothing. Then they would commence and fire the weapon. And this was obviously very puzzling. He couldn't figure out what was going on. And no one at hand could give him an obvious answer. It was just, it was just the routine they had. And it wasn't until he spoke to a much senior, and I think you should read old uh, officer, that he understood what was going on. They were holding the horses. So this three second pause uh, was so that they could hold the reins of the horses and not have them startle and run off as they were firing the gun, which makes complete sense in the 1920s or 1910s when artillery looks like this and it's towed by horses, less so in the 1940s and 50s 
when you've got trucks and jeeps and tanks pulling these things. So the point is, you can deploy this technology and, re and recoup some value. So no doubt that they were moving things faster, they were moving more weight for longer, more efficiently by using the, the truck compared with the horse. But that's not all the value you get. You need to take the step back and look at your processes to get the most from it. So I'm not suggesting anyone's holding any horses, but we do need to take the opportunity when we look at technology to see what it can give to us if we rethink the way we work. And the way I want to try and explore that is in terms of uh, capabilities. And in this graph on the uh, left hand side, what we're seeing is that uh, at the top right, so the most strategically important and the most difficult to replicate is a core capability. Now, for you guys in the offshore and marine industry, um, I would expect that to be something very focused on delivering either vessels, refits, uh, offshore operations, so evolutions around pipe laying or, or whatever it might be that is unique and makes your customers come to you. And then on the next level down, there's the enabling capabilities, which are necessary. So you have to have some combination of organizational learning, tools, experience, uh, in order to deliver that core capability. So it's not necessarily what people would know you for, but it's absolutely required for you to stand out and be competitive. And then the last level is the supplemental capability, which is the day-to-day -to -day tools, which you do need, but you buy off the shelf, fit and forget, off you go. PowerPoint might be one of those things, perhaps go to webinar. On their own, they're just tools. My contention is that there's a danger that if we think of XR just as another tool to fit and forget, we will be doing the hold the horses routine. We'll be putting it in place, getting some value from it, but not really taking the opportunity to rethink how we work day to day. So I'm saying, we need to take the time and think about where it fits in as an enabling capability. So that means thinking about how it uh, can change your processes, how it can be made accessible, how it can change the way you work within your organization and with suppliers, partners, and even customers. So tools and technology, they're transients. Uh, we know that what works today needs to evolve to stay relevant tomorrow. That's something that we as vendors need to take into account. But we're also equally clear that XR, and we've seen this uh, today, that XR can be the kernel of an enabling capability. The projections for it from Jeremy earlier are pretty categoric. And that, by the way, isn't just a, a PwC conclusion. All the market reports are indicating the same thing. So, having said that, um, that's the right way to be thinking about it. Is there any more um, coherent guidance that we can provide on, on how to make that so? Um, and this is where you might hear some things uh, repeated that you, you heard earlier. Now, the first thing I would say, and I know it seems obvious, is don't start with a technology ever. Um, I, we still see it happening, I still see it happening. Customers will come either with a delivery method, so it could be a particular model of HMD, or it could be AR, or it could be a feature of virtual reality, and they look for the problem that it can solve. It almost goes without saying that that's the wrong way around to think about this, and yet it does happen. So just watch it, watch that you don't slip into the same trap. And if you think of the problem first or the value you can you can get, so the value proposition that you want to realize with XR, what you can do is become much more focused. So Dennis was talking about having these metrics, poorly defined proof of concepts. Um, avoid that trap. Be very clear what it is you expect to get from this and how you're going to realize it. But that doesn't mean that you have to ignore the expansion of XR more generally in the organization. Um, you need to think about how it can be made accessible. And the distinction I want to make is that accessible isn't just about being available. And that's something I'm going to talk about in a, in a slide or two as well. Um, it's not just about making it available to users. It has to be accessible in a way that makes sense to that user in their context. 
And if you do that, um, it's likely you'll also need to think about how to make this data pipeline as frictionless as possible. So what I'm talking about here is that pre-processing Dennis was talking about earlier. Um, it really doesn't work if the overhead of getting data from um, source to user in VR or AR is so painful that it precludes you taking rapid updates. It means that um, it's an expensive process to see through. And this isn't an XR um, a specific thing, by the way. As Dimitri mentioned, I started working fluid dynamics. And there we had to put a lot of time into cleaning, pre-processing the CAD data we got so we could do our analysis. And it was, not only was it pretty tedious, but it was one of the bigger overheads we had to deal with. And be ready to adapt. Um, you will, I'm confident, if you've defined your uh, scope of work well, see the value you expect to see at, at the very least. What I suspect you will also find is that um, as you progress, you will uncover new opportunities. And we see this in practice as well. We work with organizations who have um, got quite sophisticated uh, training uh, setups with our software, for example. But what that has spun out is a new way of working at the concept design phase, which they hadn't anticipated when they, when they started engaging with us, but which becomes more apparent as users get into the technology and take advantage of it. So all of which is to say, uh, to go back to horses, uh, although a different um, horse story, you're not shopping for a faster horse is what I would suggest. Um, you will get value from that, but really you should aim a bit higher and be shooting for this enabling capability. And um, if you're doing that, you'll be much more adept at bringing the organization together in a way which uh, changes the way you work, delivers value more effectively, enables you to be more competitive. But I said I was going to go back to um, this question of accessibility. So the question I was asked is how does collaborative XR um, help accelerate an organization? So my interpretation of that is, well, what we're not talking about here is a particular technology that lets people take advantage of A, B, or C. Um, neither is it necessarily about um, thinking about different software or different use cases, but we do need to think about user contexts. User contexts most obviously are different roles, different uh, professions that we have, so engineering, layout planning, manufacturing, serviceability, all different specializations with their own data sets, their own requirements, their own language. Um, that is one aspect that needs to be taken into account. But there's also the timing, how they work. Do they always need to speak at the same time together? So do they need to be in the session, as we've just seen in the video, looking over each shoulder, pointing issues out? Some of the time, definitely. But increasingly for global organizations, that's not practical. So think about uh, how XR can help asynchronous collaboration between your different departments, groups, and customers, wherever they may be. Even for a given profession, um, it's not the case that they always need to be presented with the same thing throughout the project. So having a system which allows you to give them the information that's right at that time is absolutely key. And that's how you scale uh, visualization across an organization and enable the type of collaborative working that you need to. So um, wrapping up here then, um, visualization as a transformative tool um, we think there's a formula to scaling. Uh, it, it, it boils down to five key heuristics, and that is that it should be hardware agnostic. So whatever, whatever tool you choose to use, software tool you choose to use, you should look at the principle that it should be accessible, as we saw in the video, to people in HMDs, laptops, uh, specialist facilities, mobile devices. They should be able to access that visualization, no matter how they're how they're getting there. But it needs to be performant when they do it. It's not enough just to make this a paper capability. It needs to be something that provides a rewarding experience. And then the next level is context. We've talked about how important that is. And there's no reason why XR shouldn't be the knowledge sharing tool used for all professions 
in your organization. But the only way you'll make that happen in practice is if you're very consciously thinking about the requirements of um, a marine engineering officer alongside those of um, a seaman officer on the bridge of a vessel. It needs to be routinely available. Um, you're working internationally, certainly when we're talking about marine and offshore, um, it's a 24-7 operation. And then again, back to a point that came up um, earlier, perhaps the biggest contradiction is that in order to share widely and freely and to collaborate freely with suppliers, with partners, with customers, we need to be able to do that securely. Um, we, if it's particularly when we're talking about working outside the bounds of an organization, which is when this really takes off, you have to be sure that you retain control of your data throughout that process. So these are the five heuristics that we think of when we're designing our products. And um, from a Vitalis point of view, that's why we really thought about how we can plumb this together in a way which taps into disparate data sources, the IT landscape that many, if not all, modern organizations are using, um, and to connect the specialists who might represent the early adopters or the the kind of technologists who lead these proof of concepts through to the business users, those at the other end who are going to be the ones to extract the value from the system you put in place. And we'll engage with it uh, to serve a number of use cases via a number of different ways. So head mounted displays, laptops, walls, caves, etc. So that's my take on um, collaborative XR for the industry. We it, it's about people, processes, and really thinking about how you can make that work with the technology you choose. Thank you, John. And uh, you'll also be at the panel discussion. So looking at the time, so thanks for sharing your session. So let's move to John Maxfield and, and our panel team. So John is a pioneer in the VR world. He founded his own company, uh, long long way way you go i mean that's a long time ago john when did you start it was it around 2002 yeah that's a long, long time, time ago, ago. <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Feels, feels so like a uh, but yeah ago. yeah but, but also before that i mean you have a lot of experience in the uh engineering manufacturing industry so uh so there's a lot to say there's much more to introduce but i suggest we'll start the panel and the industry poll i'm happy that many of us still around and uh john let's uh, let's start okay. and let me uh share my monitor there we go okay so hopefully you can see my uh my slides so yeah so thank you everyone um i know this has been a uh, a quite a long session, but I, I, hopefully we're gonna we're gonna finish now with with a, a really interesting session. Now, the, the, this panel session, we're basically gonna uh, welcome back um, some of our speakers. We'll welcome back Dennis uh, Moray and also Paul McCall and uh, and John Murray from Vitalis and Dennis Moray there from SSI. But I'd also like to introduce two. Uh, additional panelists and really pleased to welcome them to this uh, team and uh, to your panel. Um, so firstly, uh, John Martin. Um, John is a uh, renowned uh, world leader, pioneer for over 40 years um, in all aspects of shipbuilding uh, with specific expertise in the practical application of VR um, to uh, surface ships and submarine design. Um, He's been recognized for his significant contribution to this area and in the wider field of technology generally um, in across all of the product lifecycle stages. Um, he's been awarded a prestigious uh, status of engineering fellow by BAE Systems. So this is quite a, a rare thing. And, and we're, we're really pleased to have John and all his years of experience with us on the panel today. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Jean-Baptiste Fage. Uh, he is from Subc7. Uh, really pleased to welcome him today. He's a global uh, learning and immersive technology business leader, 
um, with uh, in the application of digital technologies to drive value and engagement. Um, as an entrepreneurial thought leader and XR Solutions Manager at SubC7, his focus is on building awareness and opportunities for emerging technologies, including what we're talking about today, which is AR, VR, and also machine learning as well as, as many different areas he works in. Um, he's also experienced in leading these teams in creating innovative new platforms, technology, data analytics, help desks, training operations, and a whole gamut of uh, skills. Um, so I'm really pleased to welcome both John and JB to the panel as well, uh, alongside everyone else. So let me uh, just give you a quick overview of what we're going to do today. So I've just introduced the panels. Um, we're going to be having a discussion uh, around a number of uh, general topics that have been raised by our audience in advance um, of this, uh, uh, this, this session. Um, but before we do that, we're just going to have a quick poll question um, just to ask you generally uh, a couple of, uh, well, one, one specific question, and then we'll have a quick discussion on some of these uh, um, general topics. And then we'll have another poll question and follow that up with uh, uh, specific audience questions that we, we, we I can see coming in already um, that we will deal with then and then we'll close and say thank you to everyone. So let's just, without any further ado, let's move on to our first uh, session, which is to look at the poll. Now, <clears throat> hopefully you should see um, organizer. Okay, do I need to do something or is it already up? We can see that. Okay. We can see it. Yes. So, all right. So, so our first poll question is um, basically asking you, um, where are you on your journey with XR? We'll give you a, just a, a few seconds. Just trying to judge um, from everyone that's here today, you know, how far are you? Everywhere from, I guess, just looking and trying to understand all the way through to those who are already using it. So we'll give you a, a few more seconds just to give everyone time to press the button. Uh, and I think once we've got those results, we should be able to then see uh, a quick quick summary of what we've got for that first question. And we can incorporate this into our discussion going forward as well. So, okay. So do we have some results already? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay, let's see. Okay, great. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Okay. So that's uh we've got some some um let's uh do I need to share that or is it no it's already shared. There we go. Okay. Cool. All right. So can we I can't see those results. Maybe it's just me. Okay. John, I've just sent you a. We were image. able to see you, John. So I think oh, most okay. of us did see okay, the results. Sorry. <laughs> There's some reason I wasn't able to see that, but anyway, okay. So interesting result. I can see it now. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we can comment on this as we go. I think we'll 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 move on now to uh, our first. Um, so let me just uh, go back to. Okay. So let's move on now to our first topic of discussion. Um, and this is this is where we kind of address some some fundamental questions that have been raised already by our audience in, in the background to this and also during the session. So the first questions uh, we want to ask are really around what are the long-term industry trends that are driving the use of XR? This is obviously something that many of the speakers have touched on. Um, and I'd like to get some, dig a little bit deeper, maybe ask a, um, to, some people to comment on this. So maybe, um, I, uh, Dennis, maybe you'd want to kick off and maybe give us some thoughts on this. You touched on this in your presentation. I think it'd be interesting to, to kind of summarize and just come, come to your where, where you think the real long-term trends are. Yeah, I think um, most of the, the long-term trends from an XR perspective um, is, again, kind of what was mentioned before in the case of finding out a better way of understanding your information as well mm -hmm. as collaborating around your information. Um, so, and that is one of the, the challenges that we have in this digital world where we had all this you know, manual processes, and we just never really got a good handle of how we were able to not just communicate, but actually collaborate. 
Um, so if I was going to say the, the the trend in that case of XR and the benefit of that is is all about uh, just making better decisions quicker, understanding it, and communicating and collaborating going forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's absolutely you've hit the nail on the head. I think there. Um, uh, uh, JB, do you want do you want to uh, comment on this? I know we we talked about this in the past. I think so. Maybe you want to give a few points as well. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thanks for for having me, and thanks for everyone sharing their their insights and their experience. Um, one thing that I see as a big change, um, especially because of the raise of COVID nineteen and, and and all the travel restriction, is around maintenance. Um, we are rethinking maintenance in a big way. There are several things to that: the fact that we are able now to do uh, to do preventive maintenance. The fact that we're able to now, we don't need to travel all the way across the, across the world to repair a piece mm -hmm. of equipment. We can have solution driven by XR to facilitate remote inspection, uh, remote collaboration. Um, and so for me, this is going to be a, a big thing. And also what, when I'm thinking about like on the trends about the retiring workforce, how do we harvest the knowledge of that workforce? uh and and build onto that so this is where also ar and some of the authoring tools um allows you to create procedures that are visuals rather than having like a, a big a big book of of text yeah. um and so all of that for me is the big trends of making sure that we leverage all the knowledge that that will that will be retiring and uh and also how do we rethink maintenance honestly yeah yeah, it's a good point. I mean, this idea of capturing almost like the tacit knowledge that people carry in their heads. How do we capture that in terms of an intelligent system that we can train people on and instruct them going forward? There's almost like a link between AR and expert systems in some respect, isn't there? Um, which is Absolutely. where machine learning comes in, I guess, as well in, in that space. That's really you good. Thanks. Thanks. A quick, could I ask a quick follow up to go that? Ahead. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Maybe from JB, John Martin, or, or, or Dennis. Um, staying on the maintenance theme, one, one thing we've seen from some of our users in, their, in industries like high-tech manufacturing, aerospace and automotive, is that they're no longer selling their products and then effectively kicking it over the fence to the customer. The cost and the complexity of, of what they're producing means that they're leasing by the hour, so, but not so it's power by the hour in aviation, it's often called uptime for, for trucks and off-highway. But essentially, the manufacturer becomes liable for any time. It's a penalty when their product isn't available. Is that something that's driving the question of maintenance further up the agenda for manufacturers and suppliers? If I could answer that from a shipbuilding point of view, shipbuilding models don't have enough detail in all the machinery and equipment which is bought from third parties to be a, a maintenance tool. We, we use models to place the equipment in the ship, to manage the space, to have the connectivity of the pipes and cables and, and the uh, and the fastenings, but we don't have the detail of, say, a Rolls-Royce aero engine or an automotive to be able to do the maintenance type tasks that it, uh, um, augmented reality is doing quite, quite well. So I think that the to get that sort of level of maintenance in the shipbuilding situation or a ship, ship situation and when it's in service, it needs to get information from the uh, manufacturers in the detail it has. We, we don't want CAD models with, with bolts and nuts and gaskets on them. It's just not, not practical on a ship layout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. I, sorry, just to add on that, I, and I have to agree on, on some of that stuff. I think there is still a, a, an idea of a trend on trying to look at how organizations can move down the value chain. Um, yeah. But with shipbuilding, it is difficult because a lot of the shipyards that are building the ships are, the, the ship is not gonna be maintained in that yard. It's 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 created, it's being run in a, a different part of the, the globe. And the trend we're really seeing is it's more with anyone that's doing uh, something for the Navy or Coast Guard, because there is now the opportunity that now they would be able to do some of the maintenance. and how detailed will depend on what they can do. Like if you're going down to what John was kind of mentioning, they wouldn't be able to do that, but they're kind of starting a little bit smaller, if you will. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think this idea of, 
Um, this also crosses into the supply chain as well. So obviously the component and the subsystem manufacturers obviously have more detailed models in some respects. So this whole idea of bringing together the whole value chain is so important really with all of this. This is the point you, you were raising, Dennis, in terms of bringing not just the systems, but the information together as well is so key. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so I've got a, a second topic. I think um, uh, this is quite an important one because I'm interested to learn from you guys what the best examples is of uh, XR that you've seen across the industry, not just, I guess, in shipping and um, uh, marine, but also in, in, in more widely across that. And I think, um, uh, John, uh, John Martin, I think you, you, were, you kind of had a few um, interesting observations in this space. I'd be interested to get your input on how, you know, what the best examples are that you've seen. Well, first of all, before getting to examples, I would like to just share some of my experiences sure. and uh, some of the principles which would be interesting for the for the audience, perhaps, in, in a simplistic and in a practical view rather than a technical view. In 1997, we decided to go for our first 100% digital ship. And in that case, the CAD model is the master document. That's yeah. the fundamental change in traditional design and manufacturing where drones were the master document. So the CAD model is the master document. Drones are not produced until uh, later in the design um, process. Um, so there's no way to look at the design for non-CAD users. They can't go to the draftsman's uh, bench and look over his shoulder and see what was drawn. The, the managers, the team leaders can't see it. So we need some way to see the CAD model. Yeah. And that's what the role of the visualization system is. We use the visualization system so we could take our CAD models. Uh, well, CAD was, models were broken down into design areas. So we could take a design area, put it in the visualization tool, and it could be um, shared across. We had a 400 odd terminals that were accessible with, with VR technology on them, and uh, um, big uh, design review rooms with uh, um, very large screens, seen at the floor screens. Uh, stereo projection was the main. Um, technology, not headset immersion. We had headset immersion, but the, the main useful technology was stereo projection. So you could get a team of up to 30 people with um, with stereo glasses on, looking at the design together and, and working with it. And that was an accessible way to look at the design that was now the CAD master when we didn't have any drones. And that really was a major, major step and a major um, concern that we had when we introduced CAD and the earlier submarines when drones were the main, main design. So so that was it. So give some examples. Our design teams, for example, the engine room design team would book the, one of the review rooms uh, every couple of weeks. They would go to the room, they would put the big screen up, they would bring the model up, they would discuss the, the, uh, uh, the design, how it's progressed in the last two weeks, how the structure and the cables and the pipes and the systems have progressed, they'd look at it. <coughs> And, uh, and problems and clashes. They would discuss what they're doing next. And th that was regularly um, solved inconsistencies uh, uh, as, as the design went along and it, and it, re and it avoided rework in the, uh, in the later stages in the spatial integration. So that was very useful. The planning teams used to come along and they used to use the, the VR, the visualization technologies to look at again in stereo projection, to look at the models, to look at the, the design areas, to look at the planning areas, how we're going to get equipment in, how we're going to, uh, what order we're going to install it. In some cases, they would talk with the designers and then um, change the design so that there would be a better build, a better plan build, and would work with that. So the planning team just to come in very regularly throughout the design and they would keep going with that uh, until the, the model was fully reviewed. Sorry, when the model was fully re review, reviewed, approved and released, the planners already had most of the planning work. Then they could finalize that and, and uh, for the planning. Yeah, Paul had in these slides of the virtual reality cabins that we had outside the, uh, the, the walkways on the ships and production teams when they had a, uh, a task to do on the ship, we'd go to the VR cabin. Again, it was stereo projected, it was driven by production people. They would look at the design area they're going to, they'd look at what was already in, they would look at what they're trying to do, that that's sexy, how are we going to get the equipment in, how are we going to fit it, is there any problems, is there any uh, health and safety problems, do we need scaffolding, do we need ladders, do we need what kind of equipment do we need, do we need vents, and all that sort of thing. 
and that was very useful. And we got over 4,000 visits per year in those, in those cabins. They're still being used now in the shoot project. We had a headset. Headsets are very useful at times. They're not the prime driver for visualization in my mind, but they're very useful. To give an example, we had a captain on a naval ship and we invited them to inspect the um, maturity of the operations room design. And we sat him on a swivel chair and we put the headset on and that was a chair in his position in the, in the operations room. And he looked around the room and when he finished looking around the room, he took his headset off and he said that when I'm at sea and when I'm operating, I've got two commanders in that room and I need to see the whites of their eyes. And I can't see them because there's two bulkheads in the way. And that changed the design very early in the design and would have cost a lot of um, cost and time uh, in, in the project if it wasn't found until the ship was built. So it was a very, very useful and the type of thing where the headset is perfect. Yeah. But generally, I think stereo projection with the glasses and everybody looking at the same model is, is more useful than the headset. And uh, I've seen other examples in the in Japan. There were some extremely exempt. Uh, excellent examples from the ICAS conference it was uh, several years ago on lifting and turning large blocks and units in shipyards, how the cranes lifted the unit, when you used to change the slings, how you turn it over, and also moving equipment uh, through the ship um, uh, using cranes and, and eye bolts and blocks and chains and things. And, and that was a very, very good simulation. <clears throat> simple simulation, it wasn't a physical simulation, it was a, just a, a simple movement simulation of how to get equipment in and out of the ship. And in some cases, you need to move from pipes. You know, if, if you move this pipe because there's less work than moving that pipe uh, from the route through the ship. And there's just a few examples of how yeah, that's system. really useful. That's really great. Thank you. I, I mean, I, what I'd like, I mean, that's uh, speaking of the different examples you've got there, maybe we could just move to the next poll question, because this is actually related to that question, which is we're going to we're going to kind of basically ask people now, um, exactly where um, where they think or where they're starting to use XR or where they're planning to use XR. So maybe if we could just launch that next poll question and get some feedback from that one. Okay. Great. Great. Okay, so we should get the results up very shortly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> um, so it's it's where we expected the key key use cases are design review training education twin digital twin with uh, manufacturing and maintenance coming up at the rear so that that's quite an interesting i mean it's kind of predictable i think in some respect but it's also interesting to see that it's almost an even split between those top three um certainly in our world design review is is kind of a big one uh, and the others are as well. So um, I don't know, we're kind of running out a bit of time because we were slightly over. Um, Dimitri, do we have some time to do one other topic or do you want to? Yeah, uh, so, on the time. <laughs> yes, John, so I suggest um, um, we'll do one extra topic. Uh, okay. So I would suggest, the audience still yeah. with us, so, but let's, yeah. Okay, I would suggest we, we uh, move to uh, let me just, uh, there we go. Okay, let me just reshare the screen so everyone can see the topic. And uh, yeah, so I would suggest we just move to this final question, which was um, a, a common question we've had from quite a few people, which is what, what do people see as the current state of the art in XR and the vision for the future? We've touched on this in a few of the presentations. And I'd like to, uh, I guess I'd like to bring, uh, first of all, JB back in on this because um, you're just starting to deploy some of this stuff now and it'd be really interesting interesting to get your input on this really at this stage and uh, we'll spread it over to the panel the other panelists after that yeah for sure um i mean one of the big uh, hurdle to scale uh is basically to read the, the specs requirement that you need to run um one of the simulation i mean back uh, maybe even like two to three years ago uh you still need a very high uh very high graphic power uh computer 
um, very big graphic cards and, and a hefty computer with also a headset that usually yeah. was standard. Um, and so to make that scalable to thousands of people, it was not really the best. Um, so taking out that hardware uh, requirement is key. So seeing where basically having an XR for all methodology is uh, adopting a device agnostic approach, which means yeah. that you need that uh, <clears throat> basically that rendering done somewhere else. So supposedly in a cloud, um, you need also to be uh, to be enable on, on basically a computer, a phone, but also you need to be able to have access to uh, uh, to some of these with just a web browser, uh, not an application, yeah. uh, something that's available anywhere. Um, yeah. And so, it's, so for me, like this is this has to be this way for a wider scale application. Um, yeah. Now, also one thing is when you think about scaling. At, at, at on a big scale uh, and vision of the future, you want to also have your your creator, your 3D content creator, uh, being able to create scenarios, your if this, then that, into mm -hmm. your platform very easily, which is back to what you see is what you get kind of deal. Um, I'm thinking about, there is, a, for those who are learning how to code, there's a website called Scratch. Uh, it's basically it's very visual. It's basically blocks, right? Where you build your 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 scenarios like this. Yeah, we call this low code. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 I don't want I want to steer away from the no code vision. It just it has to. There has to be some code. There's no no question around that. Yeah. But making like leveraging all your uh, current ab uh, ability and current uh, employees to learn very quickly how to create a scenario, provided that you have a library of 3D yeah. items. Is key to uh, to basically create more and more scenarios and more and more adoption. I think that's great. Thank you, JB. That's really important. I mean, I agree totally. I mean, we've got the the, the whole idea of having it hardware agnostic helps with the democratization of the technology and making it easy to to work with these sort of low code, or if you like, to build the logic in without having to be an expert in programming. Absolutely, mm -hmm. accessibility, simplicity. That's the key. Elegant solutions delivered over the top of this complex situation uh, is key. Um, Dennis, do you, do you have any, uh, I think you you have some thoughts on this as well, I think. <laughs> yeah, to uh, keep it, uh, I guess, uh, quick. I, 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 yeah. More about the, the vision and so, and so forth. The way that I, I look at the, the future is the technology is gonna be like transparent. It's it's something that's yeah. not, we're not gonna have to worry about on, on how we're gonna be connecting with it. But Absolutely. The, the, the future where I think is is the most exciting for me is 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 a combination of multiple different technologies. So we talked about you know the visualization, but you talk about a lot of um, you know the AI when it brings you data, the big data, the analytics, the simulations, um, even in the ideas that there is a device that you know people have on the yard that are using AR that can do capture the reality that could feed it back, and it's just that the merging of all these confluence of all these technologies and, and having that opportunity of what possibilities, which I don't think we even potentially understand. It's like that saying where we overestimate the technology in the short term, but we underestimate it the impact on the long term. So, I think yeah, absolutely. The, the totally. How everything gets combined. Yeah, well, so yeah exactly. You, you hit the nail on the head. John, did you have a comment? Yes, I did. Um, we're talking about state of the art. One time, many years ago, I was across in the States talking to uh, some guys over there uh, working on uh, some marine designs. And the comment was that to be successful, you need to apply state of the market tools that are stable and proven rather than state of the art. So what's the state of the art? Follow it, but wait till it's stable and proven before you apply it uh, worldwide uh, across your whole company. So I just thought I'd make that comment. I, I, it's always been in my mind. I think it was 1980s. It depends, it depends where you are on that curve, doesn't it? <laughs> on that adopter's curve. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think that's we, we've kind of unfortunately run out of time. I'd love to sit and chat all day with every one of you. But um, unfortunately, I think we have to draw close to that. So um, first, let me thank every single one of you for, for participating in this. It's really useful to have all of this discussion. And I hope people have found it interesting. Um, I shall hand back to Dimitri now to uh, close off the session, maybe talk about 
um, the competition, maybe? <laughs> Chance to win a book. <laughs> Oh yes, absolutely. So uh, we will be handing out uh, five five books uh, to all of you who are participating. I will not. Uh, we will decide and distribute that after after the meeting. So I would like to thank all of you, presenters, panelists, John, especially JB, especially, and the rest of you. But, but most importantly, all of you for joining and actually staying on. And uh, apologies on behalf of this team running a bit over time so it makes me think that the, having these discussions with experts and panelists like this i mean there is a, a there must be a serious need you know to get the yeah. information the background etc so so we will be doing more of those sessions and i hope uh, panel um, hope to have you be present again we're also running uh, Vitalis enterprise leadership sessions with our customers talking about implementation and adoption uh, issues and how to get started and take it to the next level. So for now, thanks everyone. Um, have a great day. Help us uh, with, the, with the, the final survey. Take 30 seconds. Let us know what we think and what we can improve. And uh, thanks to all of you. It's been a pleasure here and uh, and I hope to see you next time at um, one of the following events. So um, have a great day and talk to you soon. Thanks, yeah. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.